Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, we've been going through Unit 9 of the AP World History Curriculum, and in this video, we're going to consider how increasing globalization led to calls for reform in terms of human rights and economic inequality. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked with utmost equity, then let's get to it. So in this video, we're really trying to do the following. Explain how social categories, roles, and practices have been maintained and challenged over time. So as you know by now, after 1900, the world became increasingly connected via economics and communication and transportation. And with that increasing interconnectedness came a new occasion for global dialogue about long-held assumptions concerning race and class and gender and religion. The first major manifestation of this new dialogue was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights created by the United Nations in 1948. This declaration articulated the basic human rights that belong to all human beings by virtue of the fact that they were human beings. And more particularly, the declaration sought to protect the rights of those citizens of the global community who had long been trampled under oppressive structures, people like women and children and refugees. For example, in order to uphold the rights of children, the UN established UNICEF, or the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, which devoted its resources to feeding children who were still hungry in the aftermath of World War II. With respect to women's rights, the 20th century produced some massive changes as well. In 1975, we saw the United Nations' first World Conference on Women, in which representatives from all over the world met to plan steps for the advancement of women over the next decade. Four years later, in 1979, another conference was held, namely the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, at which they proposed proposed an International Bill of Rights for Women. This Bill of Rights included provisions for women's suffrage, the right to marry the spouse of their choosing, equality in education, and the right to birth control and other family planning measures. With respect to voting and holding office, women gradually gained these rights over the 20th century as well. In the United States, white women were granted the franchise in 1920, black women not till 1965 when Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In Brazil, women had to wait till 1932. In Turkey, 1934, Japan, 1945, India, 1945, and Morocco, 1963. Additionally, this new global call for equity came right into cultural and religious spheres as well. On the culture side, you had the Negritude movement in French West Africa, which celebrated blackness, which of course had been the means to oppress for many centuries. And then now, in this movement, we saw great poetry and great art emerge that glorified African culture for what it offered the world. On the religious side, we saw the rise of liberation theology in Latin America. The idea here is that Jesus is on the side of the poor and always against the rich and powerful. Therefore, under the teaching of liberation theology, Christianity, properly understood, ought to free the oppressed from economic, political, and social abuses. There was also a big push for racial equality throughout the world, and here let's focus on South Africa. Starting in 1948, the white and black races, along with minority of South Asians and other races, were officially segregated through the system of apartheid. White people in South Africa were very much in the minority, but all the privileges of that society went to them under apartheid. And although there were many challenges to the system of segregation, it was Nelson Mandela who you really need to know. He was the leader of the African National Congress, whose goal was to create a more equitable South Africa. And because of Mandela's agitation against apartheid, he was imprisoned. His incarceration was widely publicized throughout the world, and it drew increasingly harsh criticism against the system of apartheid from the world community. And to add fuel to that fire, black South Africans gathered for peaceful protest on many occasions, and often those protests were met with brutality from the white minority in power. All of this led to strict economic sanctions against Africa and its eventual expulsion from the United Nations in 1974. Now, this situation lasted lasted until the 1990s when a more reform-minded leader took power and released Mandela from prison and officially ended apartheid. Then in 1994, South Africa held its first free elections and Nelson Mandela was elected and became the nation's first black president. And then something similar was happening in India too. As you might recall, Indian society was organized according to the rigid caste system, which often facilitated the abuses of those born into lower castes. The brunt of most of India's social inequality was reserved for the lowest class, namely the Dalit. But in 1949, discrimination against the Dalit was constitutionally banned, and furthermore, in order to correct the long-standing abuses against those people, India established the caste reservation system. This was a series of laws that reserved a percentage of certain jobs and spots in higher education for the Dalit and others whose caste had been the source of social inequality. And something similar was happening over in China as well, although there isn't much of a happy ending in China like there was in South Africa and India. You might recall that in the 20th century, China was ruled by the Chinese Communist Party, and to put it mildly, human rights were not high on their priority list. All the economic reforms that occurred in the 1980s and the 1990s were in no way matched by social reforms. And in 1989, this long-standing oppression came to a head in the Tiananmen Square massacre. And that year, pro-democracy activists demanded that the ruling party enact certain reforms, like freedom of the press. And it won't surprise you to know that the government was like, nah. As a result, protest movements erupted across the nation, and the crowning moment was the protest in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. This protest went on for seven weeks, and in the end, the Chinese military arrived and began attacking the unarmed 
protesters. And unfortunately, we don't actually know exactly how many people died that day because the Chinese government tried to erase the event from the news. But estimates of the casualties for that day range from several hundred to several thousand. More recently, the world's attention has been drawn to China's abuses of the Uyghurs, who are a Muslim minority living in the northwest of China. Again, it's hard to know the exact numbers because China keeps this very much under wraps, but huge numbers of Uyghurs have been forcibly removed from their homes and gathered into concentration camps, or as the government calls them, re-education camps. The abuses that they have suffered are substantial, and the world community is increasingly bringing heat on China to address it. So in the case of China, there have been substantial calls for human rights reform, and there's been some, but thus far, not much movement has occurred. Okay, another manifestation of the calls for equality and global human rights has to do with environmental movements. As the world's economy became increasingly globalized, one of the major effects was the environmental degradation of the world's poorer nations. Now, because these nations weren't saddled with the same restrictions on pollution and emissions that more developed nations were, much of the world's manufacturing has been relocated there. And along with the manufacturing has come increasing pollution. The effect is that in these countries, clean air and clean water are no longer a given. And to address some of these inequities, Greenpeace was founded in 1971. Its purpose was to advocate for a clean environment by opposing practices that led to deforestation, desertification, and global warming. Also in 1977, Wangari Maathai founded the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. Kenya's long period of colonization left their environment a wreck. Kenyans could look around and see their streams drying up and had more difficulty keeping its population fed. The Green Belt Movement sought to address these problems by planting trees and reviving the soil and collecting rainwater for irrigation and drinking. And finally, to address economic inequality in the world, the World Fair Trade Organization was established in 1989. Member nations agreed to fair trading practices, respect for the environment, good working conditions for laborers, and non-discrimination among genders and races. All right, well, that's what you need to know about Unit 9, Topic 5 of the AP World History Curriculum. If you want help getting an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May, then click right here and grab a review pack. If you want me to keep making these videos, then by all means, subscribe, and you know me, I shall oblige. Heimler out.